So with the, uh, the course of events this, this past week, I thought I would, would start with just a little bit of a, of a prophecy update. <clears throat> I find it very interesting that, that things are heating up in Ukraine, and you probably have all heard that on the news and see what's going on, and especially with all of the military exercises around Ukraine. And uh, I, believe that, uh, I believe that Putin is trying to put back together everything that got separated whenever the Soviet Union broke up. But <clears throat> nonetheless, although that is a huge story and, and uh, has gained a lot of media attention, I think maybe, maybe the real story is probably in Iran. I don't know if you've heard much about what's going on in Iran this past couple of weeks, but they are... It, within probably a couple of weeks away from um, having enough nuclear fuel to put a bomb on their long-range missile that will reach Israel or any number of U.S. bases that are around there. And so if you look at what's going on in Europe, if you look at everything that's going on uh, in the Middle East and how things are, are moving and how the players are kind of coming together... Um, I, it really begins to look like, uh, look like the battle of Ezekiel 38. Now, what significance does that have with us? Well, um, if you're not ready to go meet your maker, you need to get ready to go meet your maker. Uh, it, you see, the, the, the thing is that many times in, in churches, and, and I'll get to a little bit of this, there's not a recognition of or an understanding of the end times and things that are going to go on. And so you have, to be, you have to be prepared. You have to know the truth about what the Bible says about end times. You have to know the truth about what the Bible says of, um, of things to come. And, and understand this, that, that once things begin to wind up, it's going to go just like rapid fire succession. Boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, um, we're all with Jesus. And I'm looking forward to that. I was talking to Dad yesterday. And Dad turned uh, 88, 88 years old. And Mom will be 84 this year. And we were talking about his mom and dad and his his mom passed away when she was 62. And his dad passed away when he was 74. And so dad says, son, you know that big bass voice that he has. Son, poppy never thought he'd see 88. <laughs> well, dad, you made it. You made it to 88. And if if the good Lord tarries, you might even make it to 90. He said, I'm hoping that he don't tarry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. He is a mess, I'm telling you what. But anyway, um, <laughs> you've got to know the truth. You have to understand the truth of the Bible. And, and, and it's... it's it's virtually impossible, really, for me to overemphasize the divine truth. God is a God of truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. The Scripture says He's full of grace and truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. The Scripture is called the Word of truth. And we're supposed to walk in that truth. We're supposed to serve Him in that truth. We're supposed to worship Him in that truth. Uh, we're supposed to walk before Him in that truth and obey Him in that truth. And the church, as we know it now that we've gone through 1 John and now into 2 John, is the pillar of truth. It's the, it's the foundation. It's the solid rock of that truth. And so we're supposed to defend the truth and we're supposed to proclaim the truth. And not only in the, in the word, but also in the way that we live our lives. And we look at this, at this letter of 2 John and um, the immediate reason for this letter that John has uh, sent to the elect lady and her children is because um, 
there were false teachers who were trying to infiltrate the church. And back then, uh, teachers and preachers were itinerant in, in that they, they moved around a lot, but, but nobody stayed in a hotel because it was typically a, a brothel or something like that. And so they would find somebody that would let them stay in their house. And these false teachers would come in. And we'll get to that probably next week. We will get to that next week, verse 10. Would come into their houses and they would be, you know, uh, embedded in the house and then embedded in the church. And, and they would just slowly work their false messages into the church to try to um, get people to side with them and not with the real gospel. And so John is, is, is telling her uh, in, a, in a particular way here, we're supposed to love the brothers and the sisters of this family, but don't be so open with just anybody. Make sure they, they share the same kind of truth that you share. The same kind of teaching that you have heard. And so that's, that's basically John giving this, this wonderful lady a warning about what's going on. And so last week um, we dug into it and we, we, we looked at um, living in the truth. And today we're going to look at loving in the truth and being loyal to the truth. And then we'll finish up next week. So let me read the scripture text to you. This is Second John. I'll read off. 13 verses again. I just want to go through everything so it's fresh in your mind. Beginning with verse 1. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is, um, this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. For if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. So I guess it would be point number two, since we had point number one last week, is this, back in verse five. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Love, loving in the truth. Loving in the truth. John wants us to make sure that while we live in the truth, we also love in the truth. They're, they're inseparable. They are in a perfect balance, if you will. Um, and, and we... We don't use the truth um, like, like some people do to beat others on the head with it. You know, some people have, have a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot of scriptural knowledge. And uh, it seems as though that they're very proud of the fact that they have a lot of scriptural knowledge and they use it to beat other people up. Some denominations are like that. And you, you find yourself uh, shying away from them because you know as you go over there and, and begin a dialogue that somehow or another they're going to throw some scripture at you. And uh, it just breaks my heart. Because most of the time whenever they're throwing scripture, I find myself saying, hold it, hold it, hold it. Oh, whoop, 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 whoop. 
And I'd, I'd try my best to let it go. I really do. <laughs> and so, uh, it's not, uh, John's not talking about an indiscriminate love. He's, he's, he's talking about genuine, true love. And um, uh, we, we see that if we dig a little bit deeper in verse 5, it, there's a, a connector there. And now, that's a logical connection to verse 4. Um, since we're united in the truth, remember last week, we're united in the truth, the truth indwells us, the truth blesses us, and we're controlled by the truth. Since all of that is, is how we live in the truth, John says, now, lady, I want to share with you the fact that this is not necessarily a new commandment. This is the commandment that you've always known about. This, this commandment of loving. However, if we use Scripture to interpret Scripture, then we go back to 1 John chapter 2. And in 1 John chapter 2, we found, uh, verse 7, John says, um, Beloved, he's addressing the whole church, um, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. I'm not telling you something new. I'm, uh, it's, this is no commandment which you've had from the very beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard and understood, especially if they were Jewish growing up, then they would know about the commandments that he's talking about. But then he goes right on to say, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him, and you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he's in the light yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So John, in one sense, says, now, I'm not telling you about a new commandment here. I, you've known this commandment for a long time. But then, I am kind of telling you a, a new commandment. And you think, well, John... You're, you're the apostle, dude. And you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. What's up? Well, John says, look, here's the deal. The old commandment that you knew about is directly from the Old Testament. And you're thinking, well, the Old Testament, that's, that's the law. What does that have to do anything? But you see, if you go back and you read through it, and particularly the Ten Commandments, you understand that the first half of the Ten Commandments leads you in a direction toward God. The last half of the Ten Commandments leads you in a direction toward others. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 says, Love the Lord with your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 says, Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus comes along in Matthew 22, and he re repeats basically the same thing. The first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then this is the fulfilling of the whole law. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 says, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, how do you get that? How do you get to where we're supposed to be with that? Well, the first half tells us how we're supposed to love God. And if we love God, then we're not going to take his name in vain. We're not going to build any idols. We're going to worship him and let nothing take his place. And if you look at the last half of the Ten Commandments, it's telling us how to love each other. You're not going to kill anybody. You're not going to covet what they have. You're going to honor your father and your mother. All those kinds of things are wrapped up in the commandment. So, we can take that now and come back over to 1 John chapter 2 and see where John is going with that. John says, I, I am kind of telling you a new commandment in this. You've never seen love manifested like it is in Jesus. That's the true manifestation of love. Now, John, 
John walked with Jesus. John talked with Jesus. John ate with Jesus. John saw Jesus work all of these miracles. John saw Jesus love people who nobody else would love. Walk up to a, a leper and touch him. And it wasn't a magic act. It was the glory of God coming out of Jesus and filling that, that leper. Walk up to a man blind from birth and touch him. And it wasn't a magical act. It was the glory of God coming out of Jesus and healing him to see. Amazing love. Whoever would, would think about this man, a carpenter's son, being fully man and fully God. But he showed that great and mighty love. And John says, this is a new commandment. We're supposed to love each other, but here's how we're supposed to love each other. The way that Jesus loved. So then he says in verse 8 of chapter 2, that it is this man named Jesus who teaches us how to love. Perfect love. Absolute perfect love that has been demonstrated by Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to 2 John. And this is love. Verse 6, he says we love one another. It's, it's not a new commandment. It's the one we've had from the beginning of our salvation. But it's... it's a new one because we have now this example. Verse 6 he says, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Walk in it. Take all of those commandments and understand that it is about love. About love. So they relate to each other in that John says I want you to live in the truth and I want you to love in the truth and they're balanced and Jesus is the example of that and then he comes along in verses 7 and 8 and he says but you have to be loyal to the truth you have to be loyal to the truth loyalty to the truth and so now we're kind of getting down to the the heart of the matter here in this, in this little letter, verses 7 and 8. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. He says, look, I, I'm warning you, be very, very careful about who you let into your house. There are all kinds of people who come along and say, no, we're, we're, we're true preachers. We, we know what you need. We want to tell you what we know you need. That would probably be a little bit of a giveaway. And so she had been lovingly letting these deceivers come into her house. And he says, you, you can't love these people. You, you shouldn't be getting involved with these people. Watch out for these people. And you know, that's one of the biggest jobs that, that, that we have here. Is being very, 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 very careful that somebody doesn't come in to the church and begin to say, I know what you need, in a sense. And then try to lead us in a direction that is not biblical. And we see it all over the place. We've seen it in churches and denominations. And, 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 and it's unbiblical. There are, like we were talking about last week, there, there are so many churches that feel the need to move in this woke kind of fashion, you know, to become relevant uh, with culture. And, and what's happening actually is they're, they're missing the mark and they've become now irrelevant. They're... they're they're no longer 
carrying the torch of the true gospel. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 says, For false Christians and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I told you in advance. So even in, in, in John's day, and you can look around in, in so many places, in so many churches, and, and, and just see this, this evilness, that this... this uh, it's not the true gospel. Um, it, leading people astray into, into heresy that is only going to make matters worse for them. These are false teachers, and, and John's telling us, you know, be aware of what's going on. Now, here's the thing. And if you, if you really look and, and play, uh, pay close attention, you, you realize that wherever... God sends the gospel. Satan comes along behind him and sends ungospel. Untruth. False prophets. Antichrist. You know, if somebody were to come in today and say, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. Come in and say, I am a Buddhist. You would look at him and you'd say, well, hello, Mr. Buddhist. Come on in. Let's talk. And they could begin telling you what their belief system is. And, and you would say, well, that's great. Now, I want you to understand that, that my purpose here is, is evangelistic. And so I let you tell me your side of the story. Now I'm going to tell you my side of the story. You don't worry about those people. The people you worry about are the people that come in and say, hey, I'm a Christian. Now let me tell you what you need. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Those are the people you have to watch out for. And so John is saying, you live in the truth, you love in the truth, but man, you've got to be loyal to the truth. You've got to be loyal to the truth. And there are all kinds of ways that, that these false teachers come in and they, they deny the gospel. They, they will say, well, Jesus was just a man. Uh, whenever Jesus began his ministry and was baptized in the Jordan River, you know, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit showed up and then whenever he died on the cross, the Holy Spirit left. You know, Jesus was just, just a man. Um, God is not really a trinity. I, I've heard a lot of people say that. The Holy Spirit is not really real. How can you be indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Not really God. You can deny the gospel in so many ways. And so many people do. Here's one that, that is prevalent. Denying that salvation is through grace alone. Well, how do they twist that? They say, well, you know what? God gives you grace to do good works. So if you want to be saved, and you want to go to heaven, then do good works. Salvation by works. No. No. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says it is by grace alone in Christ alone. And so you see how they, they will twist the, the gospel around, denying the gospel, and trying to sneak this in. And in verse 7, John tells us that, that these people are deceivers. They're antichrist. And don't let them in. Don't let them deceive you. And in verse 8, it says, I'm afraid that if you don't start being vigilant about who you let into your house, that that you're going to get caught up in all of this. Now, understand, one thing that we're going to be getting to uh, in the hopefully not too distant future is, is something out of Revelation. And I'll share a little bit of it with you now. You know that whenever, as a Christian, as part of God's family, when you go to heaven, 
you'll be given rewards based on what you did for the gospel. And so he looks at this elect lady and says, you know, I am so afraid that you're going to get caught up in all this stuff. And that you're going to actually go in the reverse instead of forward. And in going in reverse, it's very possible that you're not going to contend for your faith. You're not going to protect the gospel. And when you get to heaven, I want you to have a full reward. When you get to heaven, I want you to get everything that God has for you. And so Paul is really warning the elect lady because he, 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 he cares for her. He's obviously spent a lot of time and invested in her. And so he wants to warn her and keep her moving in the right direction. So we live in truth and we love in truth and we're loyal to the truth. And that dictates how we live our life and how we love. It's so important that we grab this and, and, and you know, John has this, this ability to kind of loop around things a couple of times to make sure you get it. And as we've moved through there, there's, there are certain things that, that now are really beginning to, to stick in my, in my mind. But more importantly than that, I want us to be a church that grabs a hold to the truth. A, a church that, that, that that will go back and look at what we've just come through and will we'll grab it and try to apply it to our lives because there are countless churches everywhere where a preacher will stand and preach and the, the, the sermon has no content to it whatsoever. You know, and they just deliver this feel-good kind of a speech. Um, the, the, there's, there's very little theology behind what they say. Um, People leave, and whenever they hit the door, they have completely forgotten what they just heard, what they've just experienced. <sighs> and in many cases, the music is so shallow, theologically, that it turns into entertainment. That's not what we want to do. We want to sing songs about, is he worthy? <laughs> yes, he is, right? We want to approach God's word as being the truth. We want to fill it with understanding and deliver it in such a way that people walk out the door and they understand what Pastor Tim was saying. That we're supposed to live in the truth. We're supposed to love in the truth. And we're supposed to be loyal to the truth. Very simple. Very simple. That's relevant. And so, in closing today, I want to challenge you, especially whenever you're around the world, to stand strong and to boldly protect the gospel that you have. Let's bow our heads as we come to a close. Father God, we thank you again for this word that you've given us. We thank you for John's delivering this message in such a way that we can take it and apply it to our lives. Father, we, we pray that you would allow us to, to, to not only hear the word, not only read the word, but to understand the word. That we may apply it deeply to our hearts. And as we are going around our daily routine and, and uh, running our errands and uh, going to the grocery store or whatever the case may be, should you give us an opportunity to share the gospel, please, I pray that you would give us boldness, that we may speak the truth without worrying about what others may think. We love you, Father. Right now we give you praise and glory and honor. As we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen.